Welcome, everybody. Delighted to have you here. This is a, a real privilege to welcome Admiral Zambellis, the, the first Sea Lord. I just love that title. I mean, isn't that a hell of a lot better than CNO? Doesn't that sound flat, you know? But first Sea Lord. And it's just, it's terrific to have him here. Uh, it, it actually, my first opportunity to meet him, and I'm hungry to have the next opportunity. He's a remarkable intellect who's leading at a crucial time. Uh, we were talking just very briefly. I, this is a period of some concern. Um, we see, you know, the transatlantic alliance is stumbling just a bit. You know, we're not focused on it very effectively here. We got a lot of other problems, but uh, this foundational alliance is stumbling a little bit over here, and we know that there's been a long debate inside. The UK for the last several years about leaving the EU, you know, I mean, I'd, and I mentioned to the Admiral what we great, found of greatest value in this partnership with uh, the United Kingdom was the way that they could be a stabilizing and leading presence inside Europe. And that was of high value to us. And so this is a time when we really need our finest minds to help us think through one of our most complex problems. And is how are we going to put vitality and vigor into a relationship that's so important for us in our future? And uh, uh, to be able to hear uh, Admiral Zambellis this morning share his thoughts, his insights in this, is going to be a rare privilege for all of us. I know he's working through these matters on behalf of the United Kingdom, not just the Royal Navy, but the United Kingdom. And he's working through these issues for all of us uh, because we need the help now when we are so distracted with so many crises. So Admiral, you've come at a crucial time, a time of great importance for us, and we look very much forward to it. I, I, you're the only guy I know that can bring out you know, the former Secretary of the Navy, I had Secretary John Warner sitting here, and we had Chuck Bowser, he was a comptroller. I said, you know, half of the Navy when it worked over here is here today to hear you. So I'm delighted that you are here. Thank you. Would you please, with your applause, welcome Admiral Zambella. Thank you so much. I think you're about to finish Well, John, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you for the great honor of addressing you. You're an internationally respected think tank, for, so for me to step through these very new and shiny doors to this remarkable building is, uh, is a great privilege. I'm delighted to be here. I've received a very warm welcome, indeed, a, a genuinely warm welcome here in Washington, and I, I do feel amongst friends, and that's always a good place to be. Friends, of course, because you might say our two countries have some history together, just a little bit. OK, it didn't start so well. Um, but looking around, I think I can say that none of you seem to hold too much of a grudge. So we don't want to dwell on it, except to say that as First Sea Lord, there's one matter which from time to time in which I take great pride, and that's a British naval action in Chesapeake Bay in 1814. <laughs> Uh, why, you may ask, because it was the inspiration for a poem written by an American who witnessed the British bombardment, and I might add, witnessed it from a British warship, which took part in the action. And that poem, 200 years old this year, is called The Defense of Fort McHenry. Now better known, with the addition of some rousing music as the Star Spangled Banner. So I think that... I might be right in claiming that the British Navy has played an essential part <laughs> in the development of your wonderful national anthem. Not only am I proud of that, but I've come here to claim our share of the royalties on the recording rights. <laughs> so you can see the naval tradition of mercilessly pursuing prize money at every opportunity is alive and well. And by the way, happy 200th anniversary on the birth of a great national anthem. OK, to be serious, um, American independence represents one moment in our history two centuries ago. Uh, another was last century at the time of another great strategic shift. A shift identified by Winston Churchill, not just one of Britain's greatest sons, but of course a son of yours through his American mother. 
in a strategic shift that he identified in the speech which he gave here in the US in 1946. And that speech was entitled, Sinews of Peace. But because of one striking phrase he used, it became known as the Iron Curtain speech. I have to say the Sinews of Peace speech doesn't sound quite the same. And those words gave an enduring name to the post-war division of Europe between East and West. And he also said this, and I won't try to imitate a Churchillian voice, but you can almost hear his character in the words. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English-speaking peoples. This means a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America. And today, that special relationship has tr well and truly stood the test of time. And my Prime Minister said when President Obama visited the UK in 2012, I'm proud of our essential relationship. I feel it in my bones. And when our Prime Minister made a return visit to Washington last year, President Obama responded in kind by saying, in good and bad times, our two people stand as one. And when we look at the contemporary strategic context, we see that these are not hollow words. We need only look at the events of the past decade, the Western intervention in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. And in public debate, there may now be some uncertainty expressed as to their strategic value. But there is one certainty. Individually and collectively, they show the willingness of us, us Brits, to stand side by side with you in your journey of global strategic responsibility. Actions do speak louder than words. And talking of global responsibility, Elsewhere around the globe, there are significant strategic shifts taking place, differences. For instance, developments in Russian interests. For instance, the rise in the authority, responsibility, and interests of China. Responsibilities that are complex and onerous, both internally and externally. And Sino-Japanese issues too and the overt rebalance to the Pacific by the USA, with consequences elsewhere in the post-sequestration era, and what that might mean in terms of capacity and capability, and therefore the intent for the US footprint and the delivery of its ambition elsewhere in the world. I think, therefore, that we begin our conversation this morning with this question. Standing in front of you today, and given this uncertain start to the 21st century, what then is the meaning of our partnership? What is our responsibility, our collective necessity, our appetite? And in my answer, I want to start by asking you to focus on a small island off the northwest coast of Europe. And that island carries a voice, a voice that wishes to be heard. And it carries this message. The UK is the small island with a big footprint in the world. Not used by me, but by our Prime Minister. What does he mean by that? Well, it's an overt recognition of the, of the responsibilities associated with power. According to recent figures, the United Kingdom is the fastest growing economy in the G7 and has the sixth largest economy in the world. And we have the fifth largest military budget. Alongside the United States, we are one of only two large members of NATO meeting the defense spending threshold of 2% of GDP. We're a P5 member of the Security Council. We are a nuclear power with a serious missile strike deterrence capability. We are building two serious aircraft carriers. We expect to play a continuing and significant role 
in military and diplomatic activity around the world, as far as British policy will take us. And we have economic interests which are truly global as part of our own recovery from recession, as part of our need to compete very strongly in what our Prime Minister has called the global race, and as part of our desire to lead a nation through a prosperity agenda, eroding our fiscal deficit and building a sound basis for the future. My point is not to bang the drum for Britain. It is not to say that Britain is great. They're just to show that we're serious. And all of those things are relevant to our partnership with the US, a partnership without equal. There is an alignment. There's a parallel course. There is significant overlap. And that is one of strategic perspectives. We share strategic objectives. Between our two nations, we have often stood side by side in a policy sphere, in international forums, and in the military arena. And that is not just in the recent past, but also in the history of the long past, and I'm sure it will remain so. So we have a journey side by side. What's my role in this? Well, my part is to articulate and lead an approach which is genuinely and sincerely part of a vehicle for strategic military partnership. And that is through the continued delivery, deployment, and utility of the various, very highest quality assets we can achieve. And that means delivering capability which is credible. And when I use the word credible, it has a slightly different meaning to that which is sometimes used in the US. I don't mean it in terms of accepting some kind of bare minimum, which is open to all sorts of questions. Credibility is really, in the military context, only judged by two people, us and a potential enemy, no one else. So I mean it in the sense of something that is a clear authority about it, which is not cast in doubt. So it's about delivering capability which is credible, leading edge, and therefore battle winning. In essence, about, it's about loading the dice in our favor. Secretary of the US Navy, Ray Mavis, put it another way when he addressed the CSIS in February. He said, we never send our folks into a fair fight. Well, I really agree with him. Now, of course, we in the UK don't have the scale of the US, but we believe passionately in the credibility that goes with what we've got, scaled as it is for our national purse. I am, for example, not interested in large numbers of ineffective vessels. I'd rather have fewer very effective vessels because they're credible. Like our nuclear attack submarines, boats that are tested on the Ortec range off the Bahamas under US eyes and devices, and, with the, and which the US can see at first hand are Premier League kit. And if our ships and submarines are very effective, very credible, then that means something else. That means that they complement US military capability. Take, for example, our new state-of-the-art air defense destroyers. They fit comfortably into the task group construct with a US carrier group. What does that mean? It means we have a strategic asset, the US carrier, flying the stars and stripes, which you consider to be appropriately protected by a British ship flying the white ensign. That's significant, and that's already happening. And speaking about carriers, you will know that we are regenerating our carrier strike capability. Earlier this month, fortuitously on the 4th of July, Her Majesty the Queen named our new aircraft carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, not after herself, but after the two Queen Elizabeths. She has reached back through the choice of a name into our own history for another powerful queen. 
and all 65,000 tons of HMS Queen Elizabeth are now afloat, with the next 65,000 tons coming along nicely nearby. Not a like-for-like -like replacement of the pocket-sized carriers she uh, saw before, but a return to the scale, uh, professional complexity, and more importantly, the ambition of the 1960s and 70s. In other words, credible carrier strike. So she is the flagship of a naval equipment program which is generating a British maritime renaissance. And just yesterday, I had the privilege of taking another close look at the F-35B, which will be a great jet. So in January this year, former Defense Secretary Gates visited the UK, and he made this observation to the BBC. With the fairly substantial reductions in defense spending in Great Britain, what we're finding is that they won't have full spectrum capabilities and the ability to be a full partner as they have been in the past. Well, I have, perhaps unsurprisingly, but on the basis of proof, a rather different view. I have a view of the UK's continuing commitment to maintaining a full spectrum capability, an expression used recently to describe uh, the ambition for the Navy by our own Prime Minister. It's not just about having credible military hardware. It's what you do with it that counts, that ability to be relied upon as a full partner. Because credibility also comes from forward presence and having the willingness to engage. I like the way your CNO and my friend, Admiral John Greener, puts it. When he addressed the CSIS back in May, he said, we have to be where it matters, when it matters, so we can influence events around the world. He's a submariner, I'm an aviator, but he's still absolutely right. But we share a common strategic purpose. It's about being forward deployed, because that is how we protect our individual and collective national interests, economic, diplomatic, security, which in our globalized and interconnected world have taken root well beyond our own shores. Seeds of doubt may have been sown in your minds last year with the UK Parliament's vote on Syria. But that isolated episode <coughs> not derailed the UK national ambition nor its responsibility. We have not retreated to our island fortress and pulled up the drawbridge. Writing in one of our respected national newspapers only this month, the Prime Minister said, it is not just the realm that we need to defend. Our national interests go far wider than that. He went on to say, many of our citizens live abroad and as an open, outward-facing nation that makes its living through trade, British interests also require open sea lanes, international stability, and the alliances that help deliver these essential things. And as the head of the Royal Navy, that gives me a clear, unambiguous, and very welcome headmark. When he addressed the European Navy chiefs in May, our Defense Secretary, Philip Hammond, now our Foreign Secretary, said this, we must be ready to deploy willing to project force around the globe whenever and wherever the need arises. Remarkably similar words to CNO. So the UK remains committed to being forward deployed alongside the US. That's not just a military commitment, as you've just heard, it's a political commitment. And that gives us credibility, not just in the eyes of potential adversaries, but also in the eyes of our allies and friends. And that, in turn, gives us the authority to provide leadership to our fellow European partners, leadership in which the UK will be giving at the NATO summit. It's hosting in September this year in Cardiff. So what does all this really amount to? It's all about the relationship of strategic partners. And that bilateral journey, operating as it does from the highest levels of governmental policy alignment, through parallel perspectives on the international stage, through greater alignment at the military level as part of that joined-up journey is labeled the special relationship. 
Now, I mentioned earlier Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech and his references to the special relationship and the fraternal association, as he put it, between English-speaking peoples. But in that speech, he also said this. Fraternal association requires not only the growing friendship and mutual understanding between our two vast but, but kindred systems of society, but the continuance of the intimate relations between our military advisors. The continuance of the intimate relations between our military advisors, leading to common study of potential dangers, the similarity of weapons and manuals of instruction, and to the interchange of officers and cadets. He even suggested in that speech that this military collaboration might well lead, if and when the world calms down, to important financial savings. That's pretty interesting. And viewed from our contemporary perspective, I think we can all agree he was a man before his time. And his remarks lead me to a final issue I want to mention in the context of continued downward pressure on defense expenditure. In an era of fiscal restraint, how do we in the US and the UK get the most from what we have in our maritime forces? The answer, I would suggest, lies in smart partnership between the US and the UK. And in my maritime arena, or as we often refer to it, the maritime domain, between the US, the US Marine Corps, the US Coast Guard, the Royal Navy, which includes the Royal Marines, that is a five-point bond which is already very strong. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Earlier this year, the Joint Chiefs of each of our nations met together in London for the second time. And we compared notes across the table. What we found was this, that the US Navy and the US Marine Corps and the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines have a genuine two by two relationship. And that results in us speaking as one, comfortably, authoritatively, and seamlessly. We finish each other's sentences. But both the UK's last Strategic Defence and Security Review and your recent Quadrennial Defence Review have placed a renewed emphasis on the importance of allies and partners. As your review puts it, no country alone can address the globalised challenges we collectively face. So in the maritime domain, we are not complacent. We are tireless in our search to be even better together. So what do I mean by smart partnership in the maritime context? For me, it has several components. It comes from interoperability of the sort I have already mentioned. And let me illustrate the strategic importance and the practical application of this concept. A few years ago, I saw Admiral John Harvey, then Fleet Forces Command, and I said to him, sir, I want to tie us together in the Persian Gulf so that if we have to fight side by side, we Brits don't let you down. And the best way to do that, I said, was to really and deeply understand our mutual capabilities and pursue interoperability so we simply don't get caught out with all of the consequences, military, strategic. He agreed. We took action, and today our successors are continuing that complex and interrelated journey together, and it's formed the basis of many other opportunities. Because smart partnership is also coming into play in the shape of global force management and information sharing. For example, sharing our engagement plans to align our outreach activities with partner nations. And it comes from complementary investment. This fast-moving area of unmanned technology offers whole new, a whole new world of possibilities for a joined-up approach. But I cannot, I cannot discuss this final component without touching on the deterrent. We are not just co-contributors to NATO's defensive nuclear shield. But actually, in our future SSBN program, our successor program, our 
future nuclear missile-carrying submarines are rolling out your missile compartment ahead of you. You are allowing us to implement its technical delivery. Viewed through my lens, that is an extraordinary sign of confidence, of trust, and of intent. Our partnership in delivering our strategic nuclear deterrent is, I think, exactly the right note in which to close, because it helps to crystallize my wider point about the ambition of the Royal Navy, the whole of UK defense, and our government, that we are alive, we are alive to our strategic responsibilities, and we feel those strategic responsibilities, and we are ready to deliver those strategic responsibilities, not alone, but together with our principal strategic partner. In a credible maritime partnership for the 21st century, in a partnership without equal, the United Kingdom, the United States, united together. Thank you very much. George, thank you for those remarks. I, I want to, if I might, begin our session here by, by pulling on a few strands on things that you said. Uh, with respect, despite your fine words, one hears in this town the Gates comment again and again that the defense cuts imposed on, on the British armed forces um, to, to meet the government's austerity program have, in fact, put the Royal Navy in a position where its size is no longer credible. And I, I would like you to, to comment on that, if, if, if you would. Thank you, Frank. I think um, we need to be really honest about the journey that the Royal Navy has come on over the years. There will be one or two people in this room who are sufficiently knowledgeable about the detail to be able to see the truth in the statement that having a very large number of frigates some years ago didn't necessarily disguise the fact that many of them were not of adequate fighting capability. I certainly served on one and spoken about this before. They were poor quality ships, led strongly, doing their best. We're now in a different place. We have less ships, but the journey of technical commitment and proper design, war fighting capability is completely different. And if you take the small Northwest European nation with its rising economy and sense of responsibility, which will replace its four SSBNs with a new successor class leading your common missile compartment in its journey ahead, that is building two carriers of 65,000 tons each on which will be a fifth generation fighter and more, that has some of the best air defense destroyers in the world, that will build a replacement of the Type 23 frigate, that has got four tankers on, a, on, on their way from South Korea to join our fleet, that has replaced every aircraft in the fleet air arm with a new type, that has replaced the, the mobility protection for the Royal Marines with new equipment. I don't think, Frank, that sounds like a small no-hope Northwest European nation in decline. And I'd, I would challenge anybody to say that given the inventory that I've just listed, that really represents a step back from the past. Thank you. Well, let me now move to the, the 65,000 ton carrier. Again, this, this town um, fixated as it is on, on numbers and everybody, um, particularly the people who aren't naval architects have their own design, uh, say that um, the 65,000 tons, is, isn't, isn't that just a bit too large for your purposes? Um, I mean, the, the smaller, the illustrious class were, were okay, and you could have bought more of them. Um, I think I'm playing into your previous comment, but I do think it's, it's important for you to address that, if you would. I'm not sure I can really uh, explain the maths that's now got us these, um, these extraordinary vessels, although I have to say, when I really took a first look at the Queen Elizabeth, not much surprises me anymore in my life but I was surprised how big it was. She is, to be precise. Uh, what, we, what we've done, though, I think, is bought into a concept of agility 
at the strategic and operational level, which is serious. I mean, that much deck space, that much logistic support, that much command and control, uh, that much mobility on a piece of strategic territory which we can move around is a grown-up statement of intent. And we now have to maximize the opportunity. We're very conscious, by the way, that the journey has only just begun. There's one or two commentators who can't quite understand why such a vessel isn't already in the Gulf. She's got a few years to go yet and a lot of work to do. But that journey, which I didn't really spell out, has been facilitated by the further investment of the US Navy and US Marine Corps, who have given the UK their expertise in deck operations, in, in jets at sea, in uh, engineering support to grow the capability quickly. So although we're a capable nation, the nature of strategic partnership is accelerating the opportunity. And that's really significant. It is, I think, surprising to remember, for those who don't know, that for carrier-based support uh, to air operations over Afghanistan, there were British pilots flying those sorties from an American carrier off the Gulf. So it's a very deep relationship that has to pass the political tests of authority and legality to bind us together. So I think it's a platform of opportunity, but it's also a very, very clear head mark. You did say, if I heard you correctly, uh, a carrier deployed on a continuous basis, which implies that both carriers will be built and operational, if I got it right. I didn't say that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I think it's true. We are looking at options. The government's looking at options for the utility of carriers, plural, and I think it likes what it sees by way of the authority and opportunity that it gets from those vessels. And the truth is that it's at the strategic level of leadership and judgment, if you push the button that says, give me a carrier in location A, and it's in the middle of a refit, then your authority sort of drains away down the plug hole. So in order to make sure you have availability, then at least one from two is likely to be the outcome. And, and um, people in, in this audience would be disappointed, given my background, if I didn't ask you the following question. So I'll, I, I won't disappoint. Um, in a town which uh, frequently sees the anti-nuclear deterrent uh, current rise high, um, one hears occasionally that military leaders on both sides, but particularly also in London as well as in Washington, really don't feel the deterrence necessary anymore. Um, that you know that you're, you're proceeding ahead, good policy and all that, but you could use that money better on conventional ships doing other missions, and I just ask you to comment on that. Well, deterrence of the type that we are pursuing, which is absolutely the top end of the game, is entirely a governmental decision. It has fallen to the Royal Navy to have the privilege and responsibility of delivering it, and so we will bend every sinew to make sure it's done as effectively and efficiently as we can. But uh, governments own those responsibilities. It's for us to carry them out flawlessly, and that's our purpose. Right. Thank you for that. Let's open it up to questions now. And uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. There'll be a microphone on its way to you. I'm Brian McGrath from the Hudson Center for American Sea Power. Sir, you made a very strong uh, pitch for a balanced fleet. Um, that fleet has an expense. That expense has been your cruising Navy, primarily. You've sacrificed ca capacity for capability. What were the other fleet designs that were considered along the way, and why were they dismissed? Thank you. I think that's a great question, because it really asks what price the design we have today. Um, I don't own that history. My predecessors in post have made some courageous and aggressive decisions and stood by them. I think the best way to tease out an answer is to reduce it through the lens of the price of carriers against further ships, which is what most uh, newspapers are interested in. The truth is this, if you can't afford carriers, 
you may not necessarily afford more ships. But if you've got the carriers, you may have to afford more ships. <laughs> so I think some of my predecessors were extremely wise. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Microphone again over here, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Arlon Nagadek from George Washington University. Uh, speaking of special relationships that started on the wrong foot, it, it seemed that you know in the uh, fall of 2010, a new uh, French-British uh, agreement uh, uh, came online. I was wondering if you could give us a bill of health of it, but if you agree with the, the paradigm that uh, only a close French-British uh, uh, naval uh, cooperation can amount to the sort of capacity that you've been describing ultimately, and specifically, you know, speaking of interoperability, could you comment on the decision, as I understand it, to go back to short takeoff vertical landing uh, on the new aircraft carrier? Do you believe that it is consistent with the, uh, the proposition that you need to be interoperable with the French and with the Americans? Thanks. OK, I'll just deal briefly with the, uh, the type of carriers, and I'll come to the strategic question you, you place. Um, the uh, choice of jets was an economic one, simple. Uh, the cost of uh, the rising cost, the uncertain cost of electromagnetic rail launch systems for the UK was going to put an additional price on conventional takeoff and landing techniques, which for the UK was going to place the whole program in jeopardy. And if you know the detail, it actually would only have allowed one carrier to operate because the other one was sufficiently progressed not to have been able to be retrofitted in any meaningful way. So the answer that's emerged is, is the option of two from two rather than what might have been a very expensive, potentially unaffordable one conventional. But I think your big questions about the Lancaster House agreement, the arrangements between the UK and the French, you won't be surprised if I apologize to you for not centering my speech on the special relationship between the UK and France as I, as I am in Washington. But what I, I think it is fair to say, and you'll have seen it repeated in many other fora, is that behind the emphasis I've placed in public here and with confidence here is our European partnership with the French. And we're proud of that and we're working towards that. So please don't take any offense. Yes, sir, in the back. Dana Goward at the R&T Foundation. I understand that the Royal Navy has identified Galileo and GPS vulnerability as a concern and that you have a partnership with the GLA and perhaps with the French on the Iloran system. Uh, could you address that, sir? I'm not sure I know enough about it to give you an answer to what is quite clearly an informed questioner. <laughs> so forgive me for that. Um, I could talk about today. I don't really know some of the strategic uh, um, sort of implications of your question. So I'll, I'll dodge the long term. Certainly today, in the world we live in day to day, it's utterly focused on the current methodologies which we all use in this room. It is an American-centered, um, algorithm-enhanced um, locational reference system of unparalleled value, not just to somebody cruising the streets of Washington, but also to our military people. So we are where we are, and it works very well for us. I think you do have to sometimes uh, separate yourself from the aspirations of alternative systems and realize just how expensive it's going to have to be to change. So I think there's a natural lag in the truth of the utility of technology which will shape the journey ahead. As far as I'm concerned, it's steady as she goes. Thank you. There's a question here. Sir, Admiral, uh, Sidney Friedberg, BreakingDefense.com. Uh, to talk a bit about fleet design, uh, when you go away from large numbers of, when you do the, of the Jackie Fisher thing uh, and go away from large numbers of older but less capable ships, uh, it seems like there's an implicit trade-off of that you'll have less peacetime presence, uh, fewer ships out there in permissive environments to do what we would call phase zero, phase one over here. Uh, and conversely, more focus on with the SSBN, with the air defense destroyer, with the, with the carrier, 
on war fighting capability. Uh, now, A, you know, have I understood that trade-off correctly? And B, how does that then fit into complementarity with the United States uh, and with Europe as well? Because there's a great deal of talking about, well, countries can develop niche capabilities rather than try to replicate the whole spectrum. Um, you've completely got it. And um, your question is incredibly helpful because it allows me to explain precisely why we are um, pursuing the path that we are. When you have a limited number of vessels available, you do have a variable in the equation, which is whether to have some high end and some low end, to put it in simple terms. But the danger with that is that when you are needed to perform a high end and therefore uh, a strategically valuable task alongside a partner, you find that your low end capability doesn't get through the gate. And although you may achieve some short term footprint satisfaction, you lose out on the flexibility and the authority associated with credible platforms. It's interesting, it might be interesting for you to know that the classic example that's analyzed in public uh, on this one for us is whether we could have a more constabulary fleet that does such things as counter piracy off Somalia and a higher end capability elsewhere. But the truth is the assets that may or may not be allocated off Somalia are also available for high end war fighting uh, in the region if required. And if of course they're not capable, they're not usable. If they're not usable, then they're not um, valuable within the pole mill context. So I think there's a journey that takes you where you have a degree of restriction to the number of platforms you can have to a simple conclusion that you aim for high end and you accept the risk that your footprint is reduced globally as you describe it. That said, something has changed from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. We no longer go around with a tanker in tow because diesel, electric, high voltage propulsion allows us to go 10, you know, 10,000 miles range without, without having to be dependent on additional support. So we've got greater flexibility and longer legs than we had before. We've got greater reliability so we can operate more freely around the globe. And actually the platforms themselves have a degree of wider utility which is now built in, into them, which gives us the sort of flexibilities that work everywhere from the political level through to the military level. So we are harnessed, I'm certainly personally harnessed to the idea of credible platforms. And I, I absolutely reject uh, the idea of, of, of a uh, ostensibly but not proven number of smaller platforms that might have a, a wider footprint. Gentleman over here. Uh, Jeff Moore, Muir Analytics. I was wondering if you might be able to expand upon um, British amphibious capabilities in its relation to strategic lift. And if you might also perhaps entertain, could the British today or in the near future carry out a Falklands type operation that, regarding that capability? So um, first of all, on the amphibious capability, we're, we're in a process of uh, uh, what you might call recovery from the Afghanistan uh, commitment. The Royal Marines were utterly focused on that responsibility and spilt alongside US military and our coalition partners blood and treasure in pursuit of operational through to strategic objectives. History will judge that value. That journey from the dusty plains of central Helmand to the back to sea performance with the Royal Navy is a big step for the Marines to take. It's not just a big step professionally to go back into the environment of ship to objective maneuver. It's also a different world for young men who've only ever known uh, tactical engagement in Afghanistan. But the numbers at sea are growing fast. Our platforms are big enough to take a significant number of young Marines to sea. And our leaders in the Marines are very clear of the responsibility of reintegration back into the maritime domain. If I can just go one step further, what was learnt in Afghanistan, amongst many things, were tactical lessons of really great importance about biometric data, about knowledge of the people, culture, awareness, history, about um, being sufficiently confident in the utility of ISTAR to reach back sometimes days, weeks, or months into data 
to grow knowledge and make the right decisions that operate effectively at the strategic through to tactical level. And that knowledge needs to be flowed back into the maritime domain. It needs to be picked up by a navy that is comfortable and littoral, that has amphibious shipping. And that's what, exactly what we're doing. Uh, as to your question about the Falklands, well, things have changed a very great deal since those days, including the um, Argentinian capability. But we know our responsibilities, and we take them really seriously. And that's why we have the current postures we have in support of um, our Afghanistan, uh, sorry, our uh, um, South Atlantic responsibilities. George, can I ask you to footnote just to, I, I don't know how many people in this audience are really aware of the maritime lift capability that you have in the Royal Navy for the Marines. Could you just r remind people what's there? Yes, we, um, we've been growing capability over some years um, based on um, LSDAs, LSDs, uh, uh, LPH, um, and now, of course, um, with the utility that's implicit in the first two years or so of their use from the Queen Elizabeth class. So the UK uh, CONOPS for the carriers is to try and broaden the utility base and bring in uh, amphibious um, maneuver as part of the emerging capability. I think in part that's a, a reflection of the fact that the jet's going to take a bit longer to arrive than we expected. But in truth, it is the sort of practical utility where you would have expected. You get an awful lot of lift from H Chinook stuck on a, uh, sorry, H CH 47 uh, and stuck on the deck of the Queen Elizabeth. So we take this seriously, and so does the government. Uh, there's no suggestion of reduction in our in amphibious uh, capability. And uh, very recently, uh, we found that re reinforced in our senior meetings in the Ministry of Defense, where we expect to see amphibious, play, amphibious capabilities play a central part uh, of our future for years to come. Gentlemen over here, and then after that, Senator Warner. Yes, sir. Sir, good morning. George Nicholson, I did the requirements the CV-22 for uh, U.S. Special Operations Command. And I remember during the Falklands, one of the huge deficiencies you had was an AEW capability, having to put the Sheffield out as a picket ship. You quickly responded after that, and you created the, uh, I think, the Sea King helicopter with a Cerberus system on board. Right now, there was an original requirement for the V-22 for the Navy to get 48. Now, looking at their new AOA for a COD replacement, they're looking at that program of record of 48. CSAR for looking at uh, supporting SEALs and supporting COD resupply. Uh, the Japanese, it looks like, are going to be getting V-22s. General Amos has said that the V-22 is a transforma transformational enabling capability for the Marines. Is the, uh, you, are you all taking any kind of look at the CV-22 or the V-22 right now? Well, I, I don't actually choose my equipment, you'd be pleased to know. I have, a, I have a machine that, uh, that, that satisfies the requirement we, which we place upon them to identify the sort of solutions, and then they're chosen by uh, uh, committees that, that make acquisition decisions. But all I can say is, going back to your first point, which is that you know, we do see the need and we are pursuing an appropriate um, AEW solution for what we are, and that must include a number of options. So I wouldn't like to say what those options might turn out to be. Um, I now finish that sentence with a full stop and start a new sentence in case there's any confusion between the two. Yesterday I had the privilege of flying around um, in a V-22 for a while and I have to tell you, it's a remarkable machine. Full stop. Uh, please give the microphone to s s former Senator Warner um, who is uh, an honorary KVE. I don't know if you knew that, George. Yes. So. I don't require Mike having earned a living flapping my jaws for many years. Uh, I would like to ask uh, a question about the current structure of our principal adversaries, both China and Russia. Uh, when I was privileged to be in the Department of the Navy, that was our preoccupation all the time, was watching the growth of the Soviet fleet. and. Uh, Today, uh, this, this morning, we've announced further sanctions against Russia. Now, we've all seen the uphill, downhill with Russia through the years, but this is a very formidable chapter in this long history. And your beautiful words about our partnership are everlasting uh, in our hearts here, and we are 
Great Britain and the United States look to as the leaders in times of stress like this. So just a commentary from you on what is China's ambition to try and put together the size of the fleet they have in mind and today's Soviet fleet and its role in the stressful strategic environment we exist. Thank you, sir. Um, well, first of all, on uh, China. China is uh, on a journey, um, a complex journey, as I tried to describe, which is not easily reduced to a single sentence of maritime authority or um, acquisition or aspirations for acquisition of territory. That would be undeservedly simplistic. And as I believe we must, whether it's issues of Russia or China, we need to understand, really understand what we're doing, what we're thinking before decisions or actions are taken. So I believe that uh, what we're seeing with China is the reflection of its own sense of responsibility. Some of it's externalized, some of it's internalized in a very complex economic relationship with the rest of the world, very complex <coughs> trading relationship, and indeed, a big dollop of history. And all of that has to be put into the mix. And wise heads must always prevail to make sure that early judgments and uh, misunderstandings are avoided. So like so many things from a military leader, you won't be surprised to know that I need to be led politically. And I expect my leaders, and they do, they apply themselves to complex issues. And I think that really also applies to Russia with its own complex history and sense of purpose and value and place in Europe and the world, with a face east and west at the same time, and a sense of vulnerability about its own borders, which we need to understand in order to fully under reflect on what Russia is today. So whatever actions are being taken at political level, economic <coughs> level, by a multinational response to events that have occurred, sensible, clear, Intelligent thinking is required so we don't end up reverting by accident to some confused and difficult place which we might avoid. Thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead. <coughs> uh, my name is Chuck Bowser. I served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy when John was Secretary of the Navy. And we had to reduce the Navy coming out of the Vietnam War and followed a lot of the principles that you've been saying here. But I was in London in uh, October, and I had um, dinner with one of the uh, old friends who was in the House of Commons at one time, now in the House of Lords. And he, it was right after the Syria vote, and he was saying on the uh, nuclear submarines, the SSBN, that uh, a lot of the members uh, didn't think the threat was there uh, at this time. Uh, so my question is, do you think that uh, the votes will be there to go forward with that program? And, would, it, would they do it by reducing the number? And has what has happened recently with the Russians uh, in the Ukraine, do you think that would change some of the thinking in, in the parliament on the, uh, on the threat? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, uh, there's no doubt that those who, until very recently, said the world is a stable and sensible place, led by you know, uh, globalized materialistic need, now have to reconsider very slightly um, the index of risk. And as deterrence, by definition, um, has to be continuing and credible, my favorite word, then that means you take a long view on these things, as you know, sir, and you invest accordingly to maintain a continuous capability. We now have completed our hundredth patrol over 45 years without interruption. And that continuous delivery is an, an utter reflection of the time base associated with deterrence, immoved, unmovable from, from the perturbations of, uh, of uh, weekly, monthly um, risk that we see. So, so as I said earlier to uh, to my good friend Frank, our responsibility is to make sure we do that credibly and for others to judge 
others to judge at the most senior levels of government the merit. My clear responsibility is to ensure that nothing weakens the commitment to serious, credible deterrence. And I'm on record of saying that needs four boats. And that ain't going to change on my watch. It's time for one last question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Michael Mosetic, PBS Online News Hour. You express great confidence in the F-35. Are you going to be able to afford the complement that you need and want? Um, so your, that question is, have we got enough? We be able to afford enough. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here's how it works. You build 6.2 billion pounds worth of carriers. You then don't put a tiny piece of butter on the bread. You've got to do it properly. And I'm absolutely certain in the delivery of credible carrier strike capability, we will see a growth in commitment to F-35s to meet the maximum value the government would want to derive from the strategic assets they have bought and are paying for. So there is a temptation, I think, to view the window of numbers through a very narrow lens but you know, we've got 50 years to go on these ships, so we've got a bit of time to get this right. George, thank you for widening our lenses and for making certain that everybody who leaves this room understands the word credibility. <laughs> and please join me in thanking the first Sea Lord for terrific remarks.